light of infinite. This Torah portion of Breshit, especially the first Aliyah, contains almost all the mind-blowing Kabbalistic concepts of the light of infinite within it. When Hashem said, let there be light, and it was good, it clues us into the purpose of creation, to reveal light and goodness in the world. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. This was the first utterance, by Yomer, and God said, by which Hashem created the world and the first of its creation. The Lubavitcher Rebbe in Likutei Sichot asks, why light would be created before anything else, as light has no value in and of itself. Its usefulness depends on the existence of other things, which are illuminated by and benefit from it. Even if one argued that we learn in the Talmud that man was created last so that all would be ready for him, light still should have been created just before animals or plants on the third day of creation as they would at least benefit from it. The rabbis explained that the light that was created on the first day was hidden for the righteous in the world to come. This doesn't exactly answer the question because if it was meant to be hidden, why was it created and hidden right away? And still, why on the first day? The Zohar explains that the gematria, the numerical value of light, or, and secret, raz, are equal, 207. And with the Hebrew letters and numbers, things that are equivalent are also related to one another. So what is the commonality between something that illuminates and is revealed with something hidden or secret? The answer is in the order. Light's primacy clues us into the purpose of life. As it says in the Midrash, just as a king wishing to build a palace does not do so spontaneously, but consults the architect's plans, so God looked into the Torah and created the world. And so Hashem created the purpose of divine light from the higher world and the world to come as hidden in this material world so that we could reveal the light. World, olam, and hidden, ne'elam, in Hebrew are semantically related. Since light is the purpose, it was created first, and all creation that came after stems from the initial intention of let there be light. In the same verse it says, and it was good. With every subsequent utterance, Hashem ends the creation with, and it was good. From this we see that Hashem infused light into every subsequent creation. Now we see the commonality mentioned in the Zohar between light and hidden or secret. The light that was once fully revealed prior to all creation is now hidden in this physical and material world. The more we reveal it, the closer we get to the time of full revelation and full redemption, when light is likened to that of the first day. The light is hidden in the Torah and the mitzvot reveal the light. When a person performs the mitzvot with their heart, there's no end to the light that can manifest. The Rebbe teaches that if light is the purpose of every created thing, then it also must be the purpose of darkness. So we learn that darkness isn't meant to be avoided, but to be transformed into light. I always think of the two teachings around light and darkness, one from the Zohar and the other one from Martin Luther King Jr. The Zohar teaches that darkness isn't an entity unto itself, it's the absence of light. And if darkness is the absence of light, then a little bit of light, a little bit of love will illuminate a lot of darkness. And as Martin Luther King reminded us so eloquently, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Jumping into the famous verse of the Torah, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. Many combine the first three verses as in the beginning of God's creation, when the earth was without form and empty, God said, let there be light. The fourth verse is very telling. God saw the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. Hazal, our sages teach that world was created with 10 utterances, which Hashem spoke into the six days of creation. However, if you identify all of the instances of Vayomer and God said, which introduces each utterance, you will see there are only nine. Kazal explained that the first word, Breshit, in the beginning is also an utterance, the concealed saying, even though it is not preceded by the word Vayomer. This implies that Hashem is hidden from us, and it's our task to reveal the concealed, to bring down the light of infinity into this world of finitude. Rabbi Abba, who moved from Babylonia to Israel, explains that since the higher world is concealed, Everything associated with the higher world is also concealed, because it all stems from the part of Breshit which all the other days stem from. That is to say that all nine utterances said throughout the days of creation are included in the first utterance, Breshit, in the beginning. Within Breshit bara, which means he created, the sheet also means six. And so we can see from the root of the words themselves that all six days of creation are contained in the words Breshit bara, literally, he created six. Many ask why the Torah begins with the letter Bet, as in Bereshit, instead of Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, while the Torah ends with the letter Lamed of the word Yisrael. We see that the first and last letters spell Lev, heart, 
As we see throughout the Torah that Hashem commands us to offer sacrifices if our heart moves us, we see that the heart is at the center of true tshuva, meaning to return, which is how we connect to the divine light and indeed our purpose. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov teaches that a person's spirit resides in their heart, always motivating the person to greater heights, and the Torah itself represents the heart, which is the dwelling place of the spirit. Rabbi Nachman teaches that the more we attune our hearts to Hashem, the more revealed Hashem becomes in creation. We find Hashem's holy name, Elohim, appears 32 times in the account of creation, which corresponds to the gematria, the numerical value of the word, lev, heart. In Kabbalah, there are also 32 paths that are seen in the elements of the Sphero, the tree of life, which consists of 10 numbers and 22 letters. It might be a good idea to take a look at the Sphero chart, which you can see on lightofinfinite.com or by googling 10 Sphero. So to jump a bit deeper into it, the 10 numbers, of course, correspond to the 10 Sphero themselves. While the 22 letters are divided into three mothers, the three horizontal base lines of the tree, seven pairs, the seven vertical lines, and 12 elementals, the diagonal lines connecting the sphere out themselves. And so heart is literally at the heart of all creation. The same is said of words. As Avram Joshua Heschel said, words create worlds. And in Talmud Brachot it teaches, words that emanate from the heart, enter the heart. In the beginning, Hashem spoke existence into being. Tefillah, prayer, is our daily method of emulating God speaking spirituality into reality. And as Toro Imoe, one of my favorite electronic producers sings, people tend to listen when they see your soul. So how much more so when it comes to Hashem listening to our heartfelt prayers? It says in Tehillim in Psalms, He will give you that which your heart lacks, and Hashem will fulfill all your requests. As the Zohar teaches, the essence of the Ruach, spirit, wind, of life emanates from the heart, and all the body's organs are directed by the heart. The heart is likened to a king, while the arteries are like soldiers. So any feelings of lack signify a departure of ruach from the heart. And that is why it says in Tehillim, he will give you that which your heart lacks. Jews receive the necessary ruach of life from the Torah, which invigorates the heart. Rabbi Nachman explains that the way to your individual gate is through reciting Tehillim, explaining that the world is continuously being created and sustained by Hashem, also called Ein Sof, literally without end, infinite via the intricate mystical system called the Ten Sphero, through which Hashem channels His infinite light into the finite. The Altar Rebbe teaches, as creations, we aren't our own true reality, but rather beings whose existence relies completely on the continuous flow of the divine life force. We see this in Hashem's four-letter name, the Tetragrammaton, which brings everything into existence, ex nihilo. The last three letters of the name, He, Vav, and He, form the word Hove. The root is to bring into being, and it's the first letter Yud which modifies the verb as an action that is present and continuous. The Alter Rebbe in Tanya illustrates our existence via the continuous life force in this world through an analogy of the light of the sun, where the light of the sun illuminates the earth and its inhabitants. This illumination is radiance and the light which spreads forth from the body of the sun and is visible to all as it gives light to the earth and the expanse of the universe. Now, it's obvious that this light and radiance is also present in the very body and matter of the sun globe itself, in the sky. For it can be spread forth and shine to such a great distance, then certainly it can shed light in its own place. However, there in its own place, this radiance is considered not and complete nothingness. For it's absolutely non-existent in relation to the body of the sun globe, which is the source of this light's radiance. Inasmuch as the radiance and light is merely the illumination which shines from the body of the sun globe itself, it's only in the space of the universe, under the heavens and on the earth, where the body of the sun globe is not present, and all that is seen is but an illumination that emanates from it. That is, light and radiance appears to the eye of all the beholders to have actual existence, and here the term existence, yesh, can truly be applied to it, whereas when it is in its source, in the body of the sun, the term existence cannot be applied to it at all. It can only be called not and non-existent. There it is indeed not an absolutely non-existent, for there is only its source. The luminous body of the sun gives light, and there is nothing beside it. The exact parallel to this illustration is the relationship between all created beings and the divine flow of the life force that emanates from the breath of Hashem's mouth, which flows upon them and brings them into existence and is their source. However, the created beings themselves, and merely like a diffusing light and effulgence from the flow and spirit of God, which issues forth from him and becomes clothed in them and brings them from not into being. Hence, their existence is nullified in relation to their source. 
Just as the light of the sun is nullified, is considered not an utter nothingness, and is not at all referred to as existing when it is within the source, meaning the sun, the term existence applies to it only beneath the heavens and where its source is not present. In the same manner, the term existence can be applied to all created things only as they appear to our corporeal eyes. For we do not see nor at all comprehend the source, which is the Spirit of God that brings them into existence. Therefore, since we do not see nor comprehend their source, it appears to our eyes that the physicality, materiality, and tangibility of created things actually exist. Just as the light of the sun appears to exist fully when it is not within its source and is found within the expanse of the universe. If we look at the world, or even ourselves like the sun, and the light of the sun as Hashem, then we could see that even if the sun's rays are found within its body or ourselves, those rays can't be said to exist there, as they are in a non-existent state, since they do not have a separate identity. The same way the sun's rays within the sun globe are nullified, since nothing but the sun itself can exist within itself, we see that Hashem's Tzimtzum, the constriction of light, which limits our view of divine light in this world, but that it is apparent throughout the hiddenness of physicality and materialism. In truth, there is only Hashem. We are all light. We all have the infinite one within us. We generally can't see it within ourselves or even in the world as it is all light. So in that sense, it seems to not exist at all. But if we bestow our light onto another, then we can see the beams from within us, around us, and mirrored back to us. That is when we see light. That is when it is revealed. As we learn from the first verse in the parasha, light is good, and good is only good when given. So to reveal light, we have to share it. That's how we manifest good and light in this world. That is how we are able to take it from a seemingly non-existent state to something revealed. There's a story in the Talmud that illustrates this point about how good is only good when given. The story is of a king who built a beautiful palace with all of the epic things that one could imagine in such a palace, including the tastiest food and the tastiest drink in the land. When it was all finished and perfect, the king invited guests saying, if there are no guests, then what pleasure does the king have with all the good things that he has prepared? Human beings are the guests of Hashem, the king's universe, last in creation. Hashem says it was good because it was given to us. There's a song on an album I used to listen to called Life of Pablo, and the chorus is very moving. It goes, we on an ultralight beam, we on an ultralight beam. This is a God dream, this is a God dream. This is everything. We certainly can't see the ultralight beam or the God dream in its revealed state, but if we have emunah, faith, and bitachon, trust in both of those as truths, that's everything. And the Torah is where we can reveal the secrets, ne'elam, in this world, olam. King David says in Tehillim, the world was built with chesed, loving kindness. Our sages teach that the light that was created on the first day shone from one end of creation to the other. In Kabbalah, we learn that this was the light of Chesed, an infinite, uncompounded light that filled all creation. The light of Chesed is at the heart of everything. Chesed and giving are at the root of creation and at the root of joy. Spreading light is done by giving joyfully. Just as when your light from your own flame is shared with another flame, your flame doesn't become smaller. It simply ignites the other wick and spreads even more light. I can't help but hear John Mayer singing, just keep me where the light is. A reminder that we all share this desire to give and receive love and light. The secret to life is rooted in giving. Giving to yourself what you may need, loving and believing in yourself, and giving to others which creates community, something every person needs to feel alive and a necessary sense of belonging. The root of the Hebrew word for love, the very thing that emanates from the heart, ahava is the word hav, which means to give. Real love is something you can only receive through giving. We see through the Hebrew language and its numerical value, blessings come from love and ava, the Hebrew word for love. Ava has the same gematria, numerical value 13, as the word echad, one. As many of us know, 26 is the numerical value of Hashem's four-letter name, the tetragrammaton, the ultimate, divine, infinite light. So if we share our love and our oneness, 13 plus 13, then we manifest that divine light. Shabbat Shalom.